Welcome to the Teacher's Pep Rally. If you missed our last episode, we had a conversation with Kathy Chu about the Gay Straight Alliance and supporting our LGBT plus students and staff. Please go back and check it out. And while you are there, leave us a review. We value you and these conversations. Our guest is the co-founder of TLC Education, the Director of Academic Mindset, and an adjunct professor at Florida Atlantic University. He is the author of The Perfect 10, 10 Students, 10 Mindsets, One New Definition of Perfection, and co-author of The Teacher's Guide to the Mental Edge. He, is eight, he has eight years experience teaching English language arts, reading in ESOL, grades seven to 12. Let's talk about life and learning. Please welcome to the Teacher's Pep Rally, Dr. Kevin Lightman. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Kevin, welcome. We, man, I can already see Letitia's ready for this conversation <laughs> about teacher burnout. But before <laughs> we get into that space, Letitia, do you want to tell them what we've been doing? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, Kevin, welcome again. We are so thrilled to have you. And, you. you know, all of our guests seem to really embrace our new thing on TPR, which is our happy happenings. And it's really an opportunity for us to just go around and share what positive, happy things uh, have gone on during the week, what's made us smile. And I was so excited because I'm like, I think Kevin will really appreciate this as finding the good helps uh, decrease burnout. So I think we are in line for a treat tonight. So we will let you go last. Hopefully okay. you can uh, come up with a great happy happening and we will go around. And I think I'll start tonight with you, Aaron. What's your happy happening? Oh, great. So mine, I promise, is not meant to be a, a, a selfish plug, but I really have been very excited. Um, I've worked very, very hard. I'm such a goober. You know, my passion <laughs> outside of work is to support teachers and collaborate and work with teachers. So I created a um, a new workshop, and I actually have a couple really amazing uh, business partners, educators, and a former uh, Disney Imagineer. And we have uh, really created something that I'm, I'm I'm very proud of. But I also will say we just started selling tickets. We just started publishing it last week, and we are selling them, people. We are selling Yay! tickets for our that's Orlando awesome. conference. That's so, so cool. That's my happy happy. I love awesome. it. And you know, uh, Aaron, it, there's nothing wrong with tooting your own horn. <laughs> toot toot. It, it actually, yes, toot toot. <laughs> it really actually helps with burnout. It does. So toot That's on, toot on. I love 100%. it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Pete, what's your happy happening this week? Aaron, I'm thrilled for you. I was so excited when I saw those posts. I was like, yes, I'm so happy for you. Uh, let's see this week for me. Uh, I was invited by some former students and families uh, to attend a high school night on Broadway cabaret. They were bringing back uh, after 10 years, not doing it. Um, mm. Former students, and it uh, blew me away. I sat in the back by myself and maybe a tear here and there. And uh, when the parents saw that I was there, they turned around, they're pointing at me. And then at the intermission afterwards, they, they're coming up and hugging. And it was wonderful. Uh, and they said, this started with you and you put the seeds here. This was because of you. And I'm like, no, no, stop. This is about the kids. But just to see them growing up, I had them in fourth and fifth grade. And then I see them at high school now. And uh, it was it was wonderful. Um, cool. So. Highly recommended if you ever as a teacher have an opportunity to do that and go see your older students. It's it's really good for you. Speaking of the burnout, that that really helps. So absolutely kind of reminds me of in of elementary. You may remember this, Pete, you know, when we would do this fill the bucket. Right. Remember that that children's book fill in the bucket. So that's like a bucket fill. So okay, sure. keep on yep. filling that bucket. I love it. I Agreed. love it. Fred, what you got going this week? So uh, this was an opportunity for me to come off of line. So I'm always on the computer we're teaching all the time. A friend of mine, uh, it's, we've been friends since kindergarten. Um, so he's part of my tribe, Kevin, um, <laughs> that it, I'm, I'm blessed to have one. Right. And he, and, um, about, well, he and his wife have sold their home and they've downsized and they've downsized to pretty much a gutted home. They're living in one room in the basement while the rest of the house is just Boom, empty, walls down, wiring ripped out, everything. They wanted to go that route. They they are, they've been familiar with it. But what was so great about it was um it wasn't just me there, it was a lot of the friends from over the years all together in one spot. And we haven't done that 
Well, we definitely didn't do it during COVID and we haven't done it probably for at least five or six years. And wow. it was like, we never skipped a beat. It was, there was a, a brief, what's going on? How are the kids doing? And bam, we were right back into just talking about how we're doing. We're, we're all a different, old, we're older now and we're dealing with all kinds of new issues, but it was just a moment for us to sit back. We, we were all standing around at one point and we all, it just all got quiet for a moment. Hmm. And we all just kind of like, it was like a, yeah, that's all right. We'll just here, stand here and be be quiet for a second, you know, and we smiled at each other. It was like, it's kind of a weird moment, actually. And it was like, <laughs> that's why we're here. And so it was nice to help them out. We, we did some heavy duty work. What did we do some heavy duty work? Um, and I'm not a carpenter. So I, I was up there doing the simple heavy duty work. But it was just great just to be back around people that where you didn't have to, you know, kind of start from scratch and kind of tell your story and everything like that. It's just just being ourselves just talking laughing and and uh looking at our kids and laughing so it was good that's awesome i love that that sounds amazing there's just something so powerful about community isn't there and just gathering you know you kind of reminded me although this is not my happy happening it certainly can but i started going back to church like not online um and just being in the same space with folks uh still wearing my mask (laughs) Um, but it just felt so good. I, I was actually overwhelmed uh, this Sunday just just from being together. So thank you, Fred, for reminding sure. us the power of community. Well, Aaron, I'm going to take a piece of my own advice and I'm going to toot my own horn. Uh, I have just been featured in a magazine called Canvas Rebel, and I will do a shameless plug, canvasrebel.com. And it's basically just an article. Um, featuring the business and my, you know, my passion for teachers and teacher burnout and self-care and mental health of our teachers. And so super proud, still processing guys, you know, these things take time for me to kind of process when I see my face on digital print (laughs) online. Um, But yeah, just, just made me super happy uh, of the journey, you know, the, the ups, the downs and everything in between. So that's my happy happening for this week. So we have the lights. We have Lightman with us tonight. <laughs> Kevin, what you got for us? Yeah, well, first of all, congratulations. I think all of those uh, happy happenings were amazing. And it definitely inspires me. You're right. It's a great burnout practice to just be intentional with what fills you with gratitude. So I had a really cool one uh, very recently. I had a former student and uh, I taught her when she was in ninth grade uh, in English And I remember her so fondly by, uh, I used to do vocab tests where one option was tell me a story, use all 10 vocab words from the the week, right? Just really simple. You can either, you know, do the traditional test or tell me a good story and incorporate the words. So every week she would incorporate a story that had to do with whales. And I'm like, okay, that's interesting. Like what you got going on there? And, you know, she (laughs) talked about, she's interested in marine biology and she's really interested in all the sciences. And she just, she wanted to do something amazing in the field. She didn't know what, but she liked whales. She liked being in the field and she liked learning more about science, but she was doing such a great job of incorporating English into what her passion was. So, you know, she ended up being one of those students where uh, she graduated early She finished college, I think a semester after her peers finished uh, high school. And then uh, Mm -hmm. the last update I had received from her was, well, I've got an offer at John Hopkins and another one at Harvard, and I'm not sure which way I'm going to go. I might do both. I'm like, are you okay? You know, go on with your bad self. So um, (laughs) that was the last update. So she gave me a call recently and she's like, hey, Lightman, I got some news for you. Like, okay, what's the news? She's like, well, I've got a paid internship. So this is basically, I've been hired. Guess by who? I'm like, who? NASA. What? What? So I now have awesome. a, a wow. former student who is, you know, headed to NASA to do some work over there. And I just, you know, when you think about where your students go, they go all over the world and you never really think about where they might end up or where their passions might lead them. And you don't always get to stay in touch with them. You don't always know. So this girl doesn't have any social media. She stays off everything public. So I had no idea what she was up to. And then just a call out of the blue. Hey, I'm at NASA getting (laughs) checked in, getting my ID badge and all this stuff. Thought about you, wanted to let you know. So that was just such a cool, happy happening for me. 
Oh man, sure. that is so, That's so awesome. amazing. Thank you so much for sharing, you know, and, and, and as we move into our, our show tonight, I just, I just remembered, uh, Kevin, as you were talking, how, when I was really low, you know, those times in the classroom where I was just you know, hanging by a thread, you know, I would have these, these thoughts that, you know, every student that I come in contact with, every teacher, you know, every positive seed that I plant, to your point, will be somewhere in the world. Yeah. And when I would meditate on the, the awesomeness of that, right, that a little piece of me is somewhere on the planet, right, mm -hmm. um, that kind of lifted my spirits up. So I'm certainly uh, looking forward to our show tonight. Erin, I'm going to hand it back to you so we can get it uh, started. All right. I am so ready. And Kevin, I have to say from one English teacher to another, your happy happening was out of this world. Oh, <laughs> With the pun included. I love it. So it's getting better and better every show. I know, right? I try to throw, try to throw those in a little sprinkle every now and again. Yeah, Kevin, well, you're that's a star. Like, it's pun ah. dust, not pixie dust. It's punny dust. Um, <laughs> okay, so we're about to start talking about teacher burnout, and I and I was thinking maybe we should define it, right? I think we all had different ideas of what burnout is, and it's not to say we have to be stuck with one definition, but since this has been a good bit of your work, could you give us a definition before we get into it? Sure, and the one thing that people always beat me up for is the definition I have in my dissertation is a full paragraph long, <laughs> and just trying to like condense it down and get to the meat of it has always been so hard for me. But I think when you really talk about burnout, there's a couple elements that you've got to consider is that it stems from a passionate commitment. So mm -hmm. burnout isn't something that, you know, you hate your job and that's it. It's something that you actually care deeply about your job or what it represents. So it's a passionate commitment and there's a pervasive breaking down of that job's role in your life. So uh, when I say pervasive, it's always a constant in your mind. My job is not giving me what I want it to give me. It's not giving me what I expected. And due to that, there creates an overwork. So you say, I am going to just work through this. I'm going to get those results I want because this job matters to me. This career is my passion. It's my everything. So I'm going to work until I achieve those results. And once you realize that those results are unachievable, and there are barriers in your way, that creates the exhaustion, the overwhelm, and the breakdown, both of the career and your personal life. And those I think are the key elements. So to put it neatly in a definition, I would say like F minus for me, I haven't been able to do that <laughs> well, but I just kind of think about all of those elements together. And I think when people talk about burnout, they tend to talk about maybe one or two of those elements at a time. Uh, maybe it's you cared about something and now you don't. And that's not really what it is because burned out people still do care. They just don't have a way to achieve what it is that they care about and they can't navigate that space. Hmm. So it's tough to have it all together, but uh, that's, I think, part of why burnout's so confusing, why there is so many questions about it is just, you know, getting that single pinpoint, this is exactly what it is and this is exactly what it looks like. We're not there yet. I think you did a good job though with the the synopsis of it, the snapshot of what burnout is. And the part that really um, struck to me was where you said it stems from a passionate commitment. Yeah. I know for myself, one of the reasons why I got into having these conversations publicly and and trying to be in places where I can meet teachers all around the world is because I, the first year I started teaching came in with such excitement and saw so many wonderful teachers and people I was starting to look up to that were still passionate, but they were also very unhappy. And so I could see that burnout and it made me sad because whether or not they realized it, it was not only affecting them, but it was affecting their students. Yeah, of course. And, you know, I always give the example People say, well, I burned out from my job, so I quit and I went to a completely different field. And, you know, I'll start questioning them, like, what was going on? What went through your head? And a lot of people, they don't necessarily burn out. They pick a job because they think it's maybe the highest paying job or the easiest job or the most convenient for them. And then when that job either gets difficult or it's just not fulfilling for them, they leave for a different job. And that's not necessarily burnout. That's just 
you're yeah. making different job choices to try to find what that career is, what that passion is, or what's going to you know help you provide for your family, which that might be your passion, right? So that's not necessarily burnout. That's just quitting. That's you know checking <laughs> out the market. That's finding other places. But when you really care, and I think teachers know this as well as any other profession, maybe only rivaled by nursing, is when you truly care about your career and everything it represents then quitting, even the idea of it tears you apart. And some of us do because it's that unsustainable. I did, but it tears you apart because you still believe so fervently in what you're doing. And that's what makes burnout tough. You know, I th- I th- uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead, no, go, go ahead, ahead go Frank. Ahead. No, I was just going to say, I think, I know we're going to get to it. So maybe Letitia, we, you, know, you jump right in. Um, but that definition, um, so solving a problem, you have to first be able to define it. And what you just said there was the fact that people don't properly define burnout. And so when you get to trying to apply these definitions that you talk about in, in your in what we're, where we're going to be going, I think is really key, right? Because I I'm in the tech space and I get that I get that comment a lot from people. How do you keep up? You you got to be burning out because you're not keeping up because it's constantly changing. Yeah. Unlike some of the other disciplines that kind of stay somewhat the content stays somewhat fixed. Um, but I never looked at that as burnout. That's not that's not tied out. That's the other aspect. The passion part makes a lot more sense to me. Um, so I, I could see where some people get confused and they don't know how to then deal with it because uh, mm-hmm. they're not defining it properly. I guess. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and you know, and and uh, to kind of piggyback on you, Fred, I, I think Kevin, it's absolutely brilliant how you bring to light this idea of passion. And what I'm seeing is is when your passion meets all of these roadblocks. Mm-hmm. right that the real world brings you i mean no one in my prep program <laughs> teacher prep program uh, uh prepared me for the politics of education mm-hmm. for the fact that not every educator actually likes kids <laughs> you know like there are people in it for the wrong reason no yep. really and i'm not you know there are hey i know there are dedicated educators you know, and so I'm not negating that, but I do think that part of what contributes to burnout is the fact that we don't have these honest conversations, yeah. right? As a teacher of color in the South, no one prepared me for the racism that I was going to have to really deal with, with parents that didn't want me teaching their kids because of the color of my skin, right? Mm-hmm. So my passion was met with these roadblocks and then there was no one there to kind of help me navigate that, which is why I love that you're you're trying to get new teachers, right? We're trying to get them early enough to provide them with the tools to navigate their passion, right. really. <laughs> and I mean, that first year really hits. You're absolutely right. I mean, I thought I was walking in to do 15 page lesson plans for every day of teaching and that my students would be perfect angels. I would never have to do any classroom management. I just have to circulate a little bit. Right. And like all these ideas, when you're coming out as a new teacher, you hit the reality of the profession and then you do deal th- uh, with things like that. I had a great mentor teacher. Uh, and when I was finishing my student teaching, she dragged me around the school and she brought me into every worst teacher's room. And she was like, you've seen the examples. You need to also see the non examples. Mm. And uh, in a South Florida school in a large school district, to walk into a room with an old white lady teaching in a segregated classroom where only white students were in the front and only black students were in the back. Then I started to realize this profession has more to it than just, you know, sit down, go through the curriculum and it's nice and easy. There are some real deep seated issues that we have to navigate without falling into burnout Mm because it's exhausting. (laughs) You know, doing things like that, yeah. (laughs) Kevin, I want to go back to your definition. That was not an F minus to me at all. That was a eureka moment. Um, uh, uh, Aaron and Fred, they know, they talked me off the ledge a few times. I was very much in the beginning stages of burnout. Matter of fact, if it wasn't for my TPR family, I don't know if I'd still be a teacher at this point. I didn't realize I was there Mm. until I was deep in that. And I was wondering, while we go along this conversation, if there's something, any... what your definition is so obvious, but it just, it's such a eureka moment when someone else is saying it like, oh yeah, I I had that, the passionate commitment, but oh my gosh. And then this and the breaking down and da, 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 and just hitting a wall, hitting a wall, hitting a wall. I'm wondering 
what could we share with our listeners? What symbols, what little signals, what little warning signs you have along the way so you guys don't get to those stages of burnout? What could we be aware of along the way? Yeah, right. Well, first of all, Pete, I really appreciate your honesty in talking about, you know, being at that ledge because oh, yeah. I was I'll there talk too. About it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, I was there too, really in my second and third year of teaching. Uh, and it got to the point where I was uh, being hospitalized for just stress-related conditions, which I was very healthy entering the profession. I was in good shape, uh, you know, young, scrappy, and hungry, something like that. Uh, so <laughs> to go from there to I'm having hospital visits because I can't get my stress under check, I couldn't believe, just like you, I didn't see it coming. It just suddenly happened. And uh, that's actually what shaped my dissertation research. Uh, you know, burnout was kind of one of my ideas in the back of my head, but when I experienced it and I went, why the heck is this happening to me? That's why I launched the study. That's, that was my beginning point. I got to figure this out because it's, it's really trashing my own life. Mm. So some of the things that I found when you talk about, uh, those warning signs, those indicators, some of them are obvious and that would be typically the physical ailments. So if you find yourself teachers, you're going to get sick right? You're around cooties all day long, lots of students in there. But mm. if you start to notice that you're getting sick more often than usual, and that it's taking longer to recover, that's one of the big physical signs, right? You're feeling lots of fatigue, beyond teacher tired, beyond just the normal tired. Uh, you know, those are some of the physical things to watch out for. But what you really want to check, and this is the unseen kind of symptoms that if you can catch them early, you can really help yourself, is one, isolation. If you start to notice that you're isolating more often than usual, and you know some people are introverts, some people are extroverts, but hey, if you call your mom once a week just to chat and catch up, and now it's once a month, and now it's once every semester, and it starts to backslide like that, Whoever your close group is, whoever you usually confide in, the less and less that you're talking to them, the more in danger you might be, right? Because that's one of our first things. When we overwork to our passion, we're like, I've got to just commit to this thing. I got to stick it out. I got to make this thing work. You push everyone else out because you got to focus on the work. So uh, that's a big sign. And along with it, you might notice some you know, depression uh, and irritation, especially. So something doesn't go your way at school. Uh, maybe you have trouble managing a student behavior. Maybe you have a difficult conversation with an administrator. It doesn't go your way, right? There might be a healthy, I'm fed up with this. This is difficult versus a very unhealthy. You're in the car screaming, cussing, crying, and you can't bring your emotions back in check. So when you start to notice that you're feeling a lot of irritation, that's just beyond the, the normal what would be in your range of how I react to things. Those are huge, huge warning signs that are typically very hard to notice. And it's hard for other people to notice. If the color, if the sky changes colors, is that a bad thing too? Or is it... Oh yeah. I don't know. I live in Ohio right now. So like oh, the, the sky oh, is a different thing. There's no day. color there in the sky. <laughs> oh, gray this time of year. Lots of gray. Lots yeah. Of gray. Lots, lots of gray here. <laughs> I like that you went through that list and I unfortunately at times am like, oh yeah, that was yep. definitely what was going on with me. Um, yep. I, we mentioned yes. our listeners love lists yeah. So because we're lifelong learners. So can you give us a couple of ways that leaders can maybe try to help and try and prevent teacher burnout? What are some things that we can maybe get ahead of this before it's too late? Sure. So uh, when you talk about from the leadership level, probably the most effective intervention is strong mentorship, which means uh, a good leader has to figure out what that mentorship program looks like, and not only what you're doing with the mentees, but how you're developing strong mentors. And a really funny thing happens with burnout in the research. One of the top interventions to burnout is strong mentorship. Mm -hmm. One of the largest contributors to burnout is uh, the burnout contagion, typically from mentors or trusted teachers who are burnt out, passing that burnout to a newer mm -hmm. teacher. Oh, wow. So if you have a strong mentorship program, you have a really powerful way to prevent burnout. But if you have, uh, you know, maybe a mentorship program, that's kind of just a side thing. It's not really a main focus of your school. It can quickly become 
the harmful element. So uh, I would say that's number one for any school leader is how can we get a strong mentorship program developed? And then I would say the second one is how do we improve teacher self-efficacy? And this is especially for new teachers, but it's relevant for teachers at any level, right? And this really speaks directly to things like feedback, observations. Are we using those opportunities to build our teachers up and help them build that efficacy? Or are we using it to pinpoint and kind of needle in on the things that they might already be, uh, you know, having difficulty with or insecurity with? Uh, burnout really feeds off of a lack of efficacy. You feel like you can't do your job well, you want to push to do it better, right? And if you continue to think, I'm not good enough, I'm not good enough, I'm not giving these kids what they need, then the outside barriers become bigger. So, you know, building that self-efficacy in new teachers in particular, but all teachers, uh, that can be really critical. So those would be like my absolute top of the line top two. Uh, you know, if you wanted to add another one in, uh, you know, having positive coping mechanisms can be really effective. So when you talk about uh, having counselors available for teachers, which I know is a revolutionary concept, we <laughs> hardly have counselors for students at this point, but having counselors available for teachers, having professional resources that help them specifically with the idea of coping with stress, uh, that can be a really effective intervention because a lot of times we slip into what's easy, what's comfortable, which leads to negative coping mechanisms. That increases burnout drastically. I'll tell you, it happened to me. Uh, one of my coping mechanisms was uh, I would drink a lot of soda. So if I had a bad day, I would drink a couple of cups of coffee in the morning. I'd follow that up with two or three cans of Coke. And then I'd probably go home and have like my first water for the day. Right. So no wonder I was getting migraines. No wonder uh, yeah. I was having issues with my uh, acid reflux and ulcers and, you know, all those kind of things were happening. So that was my coping response for a long time because I didn't really have a planned coping response. I didn't have anybody to walk me through that. So for school leaders thinking about, well, OK, we got to focus on mentorship. That is like number one priority. After that, how can we improve teacher efficacy? How can we make them feel and understand that they are competent in this job? And even if they're learning and they're in that learning curve, they are doing what they need to do to accomplish that. And then third, all right, we need positive coping mechanisms. We need resources so that teachers know you are going to have stress in this profession. Your stress response is critical. Yeah, I, I love that you, you know, you really flushed that out for us. I think the one mm -hmm. thing I kind of wanted to add there, Kevin, mm -hmm. is, you know, in my work with with school leaders, mm -hmm. people cannot give you what they don't have. Yes. Right. So even our, for example, principals, mm -hmm. they have no mentors. Mm -hmm. Right. So they have negative coping skills. Right. They're mm -hmm. sending emails at two and three in the morning, yep. um, expecting people to stay late, come early, stay late. Right. So. I, I feel like it's almost systemically. I don't know how you feel, Kevin, but uh, I agree with that. It's 100%. just this is it's systemic, right? There are no boundaries, um, which is another reason why I love and admire your work because I always say teachers do not have the luxury of time to wait for decision makers to get this, right? Like they don't have the time, so we need to empower them right, mm -hmm. uh, with these tools. And so kudos to you on that. But I don't want, you know, I, I just don't feel that the buck stops with the leader, we have to pour into the leaders, yep. and give them permission <laughs> uh, for for mentors to have mentorship, to be self, you know, have self efficacy as a building leader, mm -hmm. right. Yeah. So I, I think, you know, that's how we kind of make this a systemic cultural change. Yeah. I, I, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Fred. No, I was gonna say, I love this only because, so my, I have, I have two mentees um, that I, they're adjuncts and mm -hmm. I'll be, I just did the review on the one in the fall and I'll be doing one coming up. And I, I could say firsthand that um, it, it's an incredibly important process that a lot of people, even if they're, if they are given some of the resources, mm -hmm. they're not properly 
administering them. And, and that's the other side of it. I, as you, you just gave me a whole bunch of food for thought and some action items that I'm going to be taking to my uh, senior just to say, Hey, we're, we're in it too. Right. And that's the thing. We don't have those resources that you talked about, like the counselor on hand for a faculty member to get a counselor. Um, you have to go to a private counselor yeah. and if, if they accept your insurance mm -hmm. and yeah, that could take, yeah. and that could take months. Yep. That and could you, take and, weeks. If at all. Yep. And, and you know, Fred, I want, what I wanted to uh, add to that, because you kind of reminded me, Kevin, I don't know if I shared that I was a recruiter, but when I went, uh, took the role of the recruiter, I could not believe the, the poor, really, marketing of the resources that the district does have. Yes. Right? Like, there we pay yes. <laughs> seven or eight bucks a month or whatever. Mm -hmm. You get at least three to four sessions a year. I mean, you know, I mean, it's not a whole bunch. Right. But there were just so many resources mm -hmm. really that were available. But if the culture doesn't have the mindset that this is important, mm -hmm. then they'll put a poster in the coffee room. At, but no one is really, you know, like pointing us in that direction. It's like, oh, the poster's there. Mm -hmm. If you read it, you read it. Now we all we're all educators. We know we rarely go to the teacher to the coffee room because. Yep. You know, we don't even go to the bathroom half the time, mm -hmm. right? So it, it you know, it kind of goes back to this idea of the system. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, even, uh, Kevin, you mentioning um, that the mentor could be a blessing and a curse, mm -hmm. right? And even in putting our student teachers, right, with a teacher that's burnt out, that's, I mean, at their wits end, that kind of poisons the water <laughs> mm -hmm. a little bit, right? So we had to, as a district, get strategic mm -hmm. and say, hey, we can't just keep putting student teachers in with folks that are, you know, disposal, yeah. if you will, right? Yeah. Because it, it poisons the water, but that's not good either. How about we fix the problem? Yeah. <laughs> How about yeah. we fix the problem? Absolutely. And I'll tell you, um, this was absolutely heartbreaking to me. I had the opportunity to speak uh, and this isn't my typical crowd, but I was invited to speak to charter school administrators in California at this big conference. Uh, never been to California before, show up. And there's hundreds of school leaders in the charter school uh, field across the whole state. And I did a session on burnout and they wanted to know, uh, you know, what are our most effective strategies to help our teachers? And in the middle of that presentation, I was like, you know what? We need to take like 10 minutes here. I'm going to tell you my personal burnout story. And I went through it in detail. This is what happened to me. And I was like, I need you to think about yourselves first. Because right now you're thinking about how do we help our teachers? And who on earth is helping you? Because nobody mm -hmm. cares about the leaders. And you don't have as big a group to, to be able to pull resources from. Teachers at least have each other. A lot of leaders have to lead in isolation. Mm -hmm. uh, and especially in a, a system like a charter school, you might not have a network of people to talk to. You might have you. So, you know, a lot of times leaders burn themselves out trying to wonder how they can help their teachers. And as you said, they're not modeling what a healthy response to burnout is. They're modeling really devastation in their own lives. And as teachers see that, they're like, well, that's my leader. Right. Mm hmm you know, that's that's tough. the expectation, right? That's what yeah. that's whether they realize that's the visual or not. So right. what are some things then that or strategies you recommend for educators to try to decrease the chance of burnout? Or if they're starting to burn out, what can what can they do? What can we do? Sure. So one of the things that's really difficult to do is taking control and responsibility of what you can, right? And I say that with the utmost respect for every teacher, knowing how difficult that is, because it was something incredibly difficult for me, right? I got so burnt out by so many things that I couldn't do anything about. Um, you know, teaching in South Florida, a new policy would come out that would change how I'm allowed to teach or what I'm allowed to say. That's tough. And, you know, having to shoulder that, well, I'm not in political office. I can't really do anything about that at that moment, right? So I could let that burn me out, but that actually hurts my own health, right? That hurts my own sanity, my own ability to not just work, but to have a family, have a life. I'm sorry if you hear my kids jumping around up there too. Oh, no, we love but, it. 
you know, it's hurt. It was hurting my ability to be a father, be a husband. So understanding teacher, the things that you can control, you want to minimize the impact of all of those things so that when something that's out of your control happens, you are as able as possible to have that positive coping response and be able to handle the stress of that piece without having to add every other layer. So for instance, exercising regularly. I know a lot of teachers hate when I say like, you got to go to the gym. It's a must, or you've got to do an at-home workout. You have to take a walk. You have to do something. And it doesn't matter what the physical activity is. I always recommend find something that's fun for you. If the only thing you like doing is boxing, you better invest in a punching bag. Like find something (laughs) that you enjoy, but you've got to get that physical activity out. You have to get your your nutrition somewhat under control. I will always have a sweet tooth, right? So I'm not ever going to be 100% under control. I will never tell anybody else (laughs) have a perfect diet. But what you want to do is just get a little bit sharper in eating, exercising, sleeping, some of those main things that keep us physically healthy. Because remember, one of the indicators of burnout is the reduction of your physical health, right? More common colds, more common flus, uh, the fatigue, all of those things really set in before everything else. So if you are physically healthy, you are much more capable of being energetic throughout the day, of being aware of what's happening and how to respond the way that you want to respond, not the way you just snap to respond. So uh, I, I think that's absolutely critical for any teacher listening to this. Get that physical routine as much under control as possible and find people who will keep you accountable to it. Mm, that's key. Right. Yeah. Cause you're not going to do it on your own. Uh, you know, some people are that disciplined, but even if you are that disciplined, you know, it's smart to have people on your side. Right. Uh, and then the same thing happens mentally. What are you doing for your mental wellness? Are you, uh, this is why I loved your intro so much. Do you have a daily gratitude practice? or a weekly gratitude practice, do you express gratitude at all uh, in an intentional way? Sometimes we just say it like in passing, you see somebody do something cool, like, hey, that was cool. But having that intentional gratitude practice, uh, having trusted people who you can talk to when you're hurt or when you're not doing well, those things are absolutely critical. And when I say trusted people, I wanna be really clear on this. There's a big difference between venting and finding help, right? A lot of teachers, and if you've ever been in a teacher's lounge, you know it, a lot of teachers succumb to venting. And the problem with that is teaching is tough. So if I vent about something, you vent about something, somebody else is gonna vent. So now, instead of being mad about one thing or frustrated about one thing, I'm now frustrated about the problems (laughs) of everybody in the room. (laughs) And that is why they see in research, burnout is contagious. It does pass from person to person. So finding people that you can trust and saying, I need help and support in this area. I am hurting. I don't have the capacity to deal with your hurt right now. Can you deal with the capacity of my hurt? Can you help walk me through this and strengthen me past whatever I'm dealing with? And then, you know, hopefully I'm in a better position where if you need something, I can come to you. And that can be anybody. That could be another teacher who is maybe solid in the field and doing well and feeling comfortable. This could be an administrator, a counselor, could be a friend outside of the profession that has no idea what you're going through, but can offer a good listening ear without just discouraging you and being like, yeah, you should be ticked off. Go down (laughs) that deep end and just be sad about it. You know, like. That group think, it definitely becomes like group think, you know? Mm-hmm. So uh, I just wanted to add for all of our listeners out there, because I know that even at the start of grade level meetings, I don't know about you guys, but when you're with your tribe, right? Like your uh, content area or your grade level, the first 15, 20 minutes is venting and just uh, pissed off fest, right? Yeah. So I want to recommend a very quick activity. Have everybody just vent on paper, get it all out, all out, and then have a shredder and we have a shredding ceremony Mm. and we shred all of the vent and then we get down to business because the key is to get it out of you and not become contagious. And I think that that could be a really great way to 
kind of kill two birds with one stone, right? Modeling, getting it out. We value what you have to say. And now let's 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 try to get down to business here. Yeah, so it's just an extra little tidbit there. Yeah, that was, we had a did we there was a similar tip, right? Wasn't there one where you, you could write it on paper and grab the paper, ball it up, and then toss it yep. in the garbage can? Snowball, That's the other one. absolutely. Snowball yeah. Some teeth. People like the shredder because you know, like the that. likelihood of someone putting that together and trying to come back <laughs> and get you. You it's said like what? It, yes, what? I can't believe it. It just Kevin, gives I'd it like a to, finality. I'd like to talk about our new teachers. Yes. Uh, they're, they're facing a tidal wave as they enter. And uh, the book that you have, that uh, you co-authored recently came out, Crushing It from the Start, 50 Tips for New Teachers. I'm thinking of a former student of mine, a uh, special ed teacher. She didn't last a year. And it, it broke my heart uh, to see that. And we really tried uh, helping her, but she just said, I, I can't, I can't, this is not right for me. And she, it, it's a loss for our profession and for the school she was at. I was wondering, can you share with us any tips from the book, anything you'd like to talk about? What could we do maybe geared more towards our newbies? We really need sure. to look out for them. Yeah. So uh, I'm just, I was so grateful to be a part of that project. I think it's such a great resource for new teachers. And when you really think about somebody entering the field, go back to the definition of burnout. My, my F minus, except for in Pete's eyes, oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> definition of burnout. Uh, remember the very start of it. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> the very start of it is passionate commitment. Those two words are the very start of burnout. You cannot have burnout without first having passionate commitment. Mm. So if you think about Pete's student coming in as a new teacher, they are not coming in as some kid trying out a job. They're not coming in as somebody that's just trying to make a living and get by and do whatever was you know, available at the time. You are dealing with a passionate, committed employee who believes in the mission of education as a whole. Before they even stepped foot in that school and thought about what my purpose is in this specific place, they're thinking about their role literally in society. And this grand scheme of how they want to make the world a better place and how they believe that children are the route to do that. That's step one. So when you come into a school for the very first time and you realize the, the very real challenges that you're going to face. And for most of us, you know, that happens on day one, right? <laughs> or at least after the first week, because you have your meeting week and they say, oh, everything's going to be fine. You'll get your class schedule soon. Set up your desk, make your room pretty. And then week two Here's now, oh, we told you you were going to have, you know, 20 students per class, but it's actually 50 and <laughs> you're teaching three different subjects. Uh, no, we don't have lesson plans for you, but good luck. And they hit that. Yeah. And remember, they are not weighing that against this is my job and I have to get this paycheck. They're weighing that against this is my role in society and the person I'm trying to become and the, the positive, great influence I'm trying to be for these children. So they're not just weighing this and saying, oh, you know, hard job. Maybe I should find an easy job. They're looking at this like, I believe with the entire soul of who I am, that this is where I need to be and where I need to be is not sustainable. And I don't think I can live like this. So you're talking one week into a job and it's already tearing you in half between the person you want to be and the reality you're facing. How do you reconcile that? So you know, the book is going to give a lot of tips and strategies for new teachers. A lot of it is about coming up with that difference, understanding that, yes, you do have a great role in society, but the start of that role is being healthy. The start of that role is making a job that's manageable for you so that you can position yourself to be that positive influence and to do those things that you want to do in society, right? Because you, you can't ignore yourself to do that you lose after a year. And many teachers have that story. It's not just one student here or there. It's very common that the one year mark, the two year mark, by five years, we've lost half of our, our new teachers. And that's the stat. So uh, that's okay. what the book really does. It dives into how do we balance our time? How do we balance our energy? And how do we create priorities that are gonna allow us to be a functional teacher, be in the field and stay in the field so that we can learn how to make that positive impact we always dreamed of 
without falling victim to burnout that quickly when the learning curve is the hardest. Man, we all need you in our trusted tribe. That's for I mean, sure. That's so it. I'm, I'm happy curious. to be there. Just <laughs> yeah, let me yeah. in and I'm there. <laughs> awesome. Kevin, I'm wondering, is there a teacher, coach, mentor, someone that uh, instilled some of this spark that we're, we're seeing in you in this conversation that you'd like to share? Uh, there's two that come right to my mind. And, you know, I was actually a very bad student uh, growing up. I barely graduated from high school. I felt like I had no mentors, nobody I really was that into. I was an athlete. I only cared about sports. And even then, like, eh, you know, not as much as I should have. Uh, so uh, I went to college. I dropped out of my first college. I failed out of my second college. And I, I really struggled just with my own identity and what I was doing and what my purpose was. And, you know, once I got my life back on track, I ended up at Florida Atlantic University. And I was very lucky to meet these two very strong women uh, at the same time in my life. One uh, was at Florida Atlantic University. Her name is Dr. Tracy Baxley. She was my dissertation chair. She was a big reason why I went for a PhD after I finished my master's. I'm like, I'm done with school. That was enough. <laughs> She's like, I don't think you are done. I think there's more to your work than, you know, what you left on the table. And, you know, she really pushed me. She uh, has a beautiful family, five children. She is one of the people that really pushed me to say, you know what? I can be a professional. I can be a doctor of education but I can also be a family man. And I can also really care about building my own family. Here we are with three beautiful kids now uh, with my wife. And, and, you know, she is one of those big motivators for that work-life balance. And then uh, Adrian Rashbaum was the teacher who did my student teaching. And she's the lady that would show me, this is how I do it. I expect you to find your way to do it and insert your creativity into my classroom. I will show you how I structure things so you can learn and you can feel comfortable here, but I need you to insert who you are and what you're going to become as a teacher into this class. And then she's also the lady that said, you know what, I'm going to show you the best teachers in the school and I'm going to show you the worst teachers in the school. So you can see not only what you want to become, but you can see how it can happen if you don't stick to your purpose and your mission. So uh, those two women have done incredible things in my life and I'm just so grateful for them. Wow. Those are incredible stories and good things to model for all of us. So at this point, we're going to um, take a moment and there's been so many things that we've talked about, but we're going to try to give at least one takeaway from it and share it with everyone. And Kevin, you as our guest kind of get the the last word. If there was something that came to your mind during this conversation or a last little piece of uh, advice or insight that you want to leave with us. Is that okay? Yeah, I'm sorry. I cut out just there for a second. Um, you're, you're fine. Don't worry about it. We're just my internet just went right when you started. I'm like, no. That's okay. <laughs> we're we're good. Sorry. We're good. Um, so we're going to go around and do a quick takeaway from each of us oh, okay. from the conversation. And you as our guest kind of get the last word. Does that sound good? Yes, ma'am. I'm, I'm ready. Go for right. it. Great. Fred, I'm going to call on you first. I, so there's a lot, so many good things here, Kevin. Thanks for being here today. I, I really felt this was a a timely talk for me where I'm, what I'm going to be doing. And I think where I was focused on was a lot of the comments you said about mentoring, as I had shared earlier. And um, so you said something, this isn't going to be the most positive takeaway, but you said something that's going to really resonate with me as I look at the approach we have for mentoring and that's modeling devastation. That, that is, that, that hit me like, that was like mm. piercing my soul. I was like, cause that's what we see. And, and I, and I, because of my background, I was chalking it up to leadership by example. Um, you model how you want to be that leader. And we, when we're doing these evaluations, we need to be modeling and, and helping. We're mentoring because we're, we're trying to bring somebody up and, and along, not squash them and push them away. And uh, that was the thing. So as I was on there, I was like, bad. Mm. I don't know if you can see it. I was like, bad, 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 modeling devastation. But thank you. And I think ultimately the, the whole, everything tying back to the commission or the passion um, being compassionate. Uh, uh, that's the commitment of passion. I'm sorry. I think that's key stuff. So thank you. They're all really great takeaways. Thank Good. you. Fred. How about you, Letitia? Well, Kevin, 
buddy. I was so happy to know that we actually connected before. So, yes. so, so thrilled about the reconnection. I love it. You know, and you gave so many wonderful um, tips and strategies. But I think what what really my big takeaway and what I'm admiring most about you is your courage to be vulnerable. You talked about being at that big conference and realizing that you had to pivot. And the pivot was not more, I'm going to shove more workshop stuff down your throat, but I'm going to be vulnerable and share my story, right? That vulnerability gave you the oomph along with your mentor to really say, you know what, I'm going to dig into this and I'm going to study and I'm going to figure this thing out. And that started, I believe, with your vulnerability. And then you ended it with the vulnerability, right? Talking about, hey, how do I balance all this out? So for me, you know, it's your vulnerability that that kind of struck me. And then in a society that really does not give us space to be vulnerable, especially if you're a male, a man, right? So kudos to you on your vulnerability and all of the great work that you're doing to bring some health to our profession. So thank you, sir. Thank you. All right, Pete. Yeah, I wrote down a few things. Uh, the importance of positive mentor a connection relationship. Um, I, I realized uh, I've been teaching 19 years. I never had a mentor uh, until tonight. I said, I didn't even wow. have, what, what's this? So uh, if mm-hmm. there's anybody out there that wants a, a teacher, that <laughs> music teacher that's been teaching 19 years that thinks I could be a lot better. Mm-hmm. Uh, hey, look me up. I'd love to have you. So that's that. <laughs> so that's awesome. And then I wrote down uh, negativity is contagious, uh, but mm-hmm. so is positivity. And uh, made me think of my team. I'm a music teacher. As I said, uh, I'm on the team of enrichment teachers, the specialists. We have lunch every day. Uh, We listen, we share, we lift each other up. We call each other out. We challenge each other. We agree and we disagree. But I think we are a true, really, really great team. Um, Mm -hmm. And I I would wish that upon everybody in a school. It's a really good situation, very healthy. And I'm thankful for them. I'm also thankful for all the common sense awareness and like, aha, things you sent with us tonight. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it. So yeah, I was kind of the same. I took so many notes, so (laughs) many notes, even drew pictures. I was all in. Um, The two things that struck me during this conversation, one, I was writing down or the thought that kept coming to my mind, one of the things that we really are talking about when teachers are at a burnout is heart is heartbreak. I feel like there's it's like you're heartbroken and people that I've seen that are either going through it and they're feeling like they've got to leave, but they don't want to. It's just very hard. It really feels like you're trying to work through someone who's going through heartbreak and then to try to regain the trust with the relationship of the school or whatever they're mm-hmm. at is very difficult. So um, this word heartbroken kept coming to my mind as I, as we were talking. And then the next thing was the importance of body language. I can't tell you how many times tonight, Kevin, even during the happy happenings, just looking at you, you give us positive nods, you have a smile on your face, a light in your eyes. And it just, it just felt really good. And I think sometimes we don't realize our body language uh, and how helpful or not helpful it can be. Um, and so I just wanted to say, I, I appreciate that. And uh, just felt like you were just one of us and it was a really nice conversation. So with that, I will leave it to you for any final words or thoughts that you had in our conversation today. Thank you so much. And that kind of leads into one of the things I was thinking is I just have so much gratitude when I'm around genuine, authentic educators, which you four are. And, you know, there's a lot of teachers out there. There's a lot of people in the profession, but having genuine, authentic educators who care at any level, at all levels, because educators are all over the place. It's, it fills my heart. It makes it easier for me to smile and laugh and feel comfortable, <laughs> even when we are digging into vulnerabilities. So uh, that's been a real joy and a pleasure. So I'm grateful for you having me here. Uh, and then I think the biggest takeaway that I want anybody who's listening to have. So if you're listening, double listen, like, like, <laughs> you know, get ready. Your for this. The most important part of this burnout work is actually understanding that it's worth doing. Mm. Right. So many times we say, you know what, you know, I'm starting to feel a little burnt out but I can manage it right now because I've got to get this work done. I've got to grade papers all night tonight. I've got to just answer 80 more emails and then I can start thinking about my burnout, right? Understanding that burnout is 
the most important thing that you have to be working against before you can even think about your actual teaching job. Because if you don't take care of it, you will not have a teaching job. And what you may lose isn't just the career. You might lose your family, your relationships, and your health. It can devastate your entire life. Yeah. It doesn't just stay at work. So just take this podcast as that opportunity to say, you know what? I need to start working on my burnout. And I might not know exactly what I'm going to do or what exact steps I need to take, but I'm going to sit down and I'm going to spend intentional time working on it from this is my day one. And I'm going to get better every day. Nice. Those are really valuable final words. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Um, I'm pretty sure I saw all your books are available on Amazon. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, great. And then how else might our listeners connect with you if they want to reach out? You can find me on Twitter if you can type my last name, <laughs> Kevin Lightman, uh, at Kevin Lightman on Twitter. Uh, I'm also, I've been on TikTok a lot lately. I've really been enjoying it there. Uh, there's actually a really strong, uh, helpful education community on TikTok. I didn't realize that until I got on. Uh, so you can find me there at TLC Educates. Uh, I, I'm really active there, having a lot of fun. So I'd love for you to join in throw some videos out there on education. It's a great platform for it. Yeah, it sounds like a great way to play and explore. Okay, Pete, how about our listeners? Where can they continue to connect with us? So you can follow us on Instagram, on YouTube. Our website is teacherpeprelli.com and leave us a review wherever you're listening to us. And then also our Facebook group. And Aaron, we still have that novel effect contest giveaway going on, right? We sure do. We've had some people getting on there. So we're going to extend it a little bit longer for the free giveaway of a one-year premium subscription for novel effect. Got to make sure you're following us on our Facebook group. If you already are, you've already done one thing. Second thing is introduce yourself. Tell us who you are, where you're from. And then we'd love to hear your favorite book or one of your favorite books. Cause you know, that's just what I like. Cool. Great. Well, Kevin, thank awesome. you so much for coming here. You crushed it. And <laughs> uh, we hope to have you back again and that all our friends out there take care of themselves and uh, really be mindful if burnout is approaching. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you, sir. Or not. <laughs> We're going to do another episode right now. Not. And <laughs> <that's> <laughs>